Welcome to Instruction Discussion, our weekly look at the latest topics and trends in education affecting schools here on Long Island and schools around the world. Whether you're a teacher, parent, or student, listen for tips and strategies to help you navigate the educational landscape. There's a bell. It's time to start today's Instruction Discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hello, I'm Kevin Boston Hill, and welcome to Instruction Discussion, where each week we will examine a recent trend or development in education and its impact on Long Island. 2024 marks 70 years since the landmark Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. That case in 1954 found that state laws that establish racial, racial segregation in public schools are unconstitutional even if the segregated schools are otherwise equal in quality. In essence, it decided separate is inherently unequal. Now, from the first day schools were integrated, efforts existed to close the achievement gap between white students and black students. While there are those who will say segregated schools are better for black achievement, the data suggests otherwise, that students perform better in an integrated environment. In fact, during the 1970s and 1980s, the achievement gap was actually narrowing, getting to its most narrow point in 1988. Those gains have since been lost. The question is, how did this happen? And what can we do to get back on track? To help us understand how the achievement gap has changed since the Brown versus Board of Ed decision, today we welcome back to the classroom Jill Barche college professor and journalist with the Heckinger Report. Ms. Barche, welcome back to Instruction Discussion on 90.3 WHPC. Kevin, it's wonderful to be here. And just one point of clarification, Uh I'm not a college professor. I'm just a mere journalist, but I I try to talk to a lot of professors. <laughs> well, you know what? You, you should be because what, what you do and the, the level of research that you do to, go, to write your articles is college worthy. So maybe I'm putting it out there in the ether as some, for something, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, we, we know, let's go ahead and get right into the story because you've actually done quite a, an extensive reporting on uh, where we are with school segregation and so forth. So we know that while the Supreme Court did abolish school segregation in 1954, it took some years for schools to be truly integrated. So why was there this gap from the uh, the Supreme Court decision and the actuality things put, being put in place? There was nothing forcing schools to integrate after the Supreme Court decision. So it was up to an individual black family to walk over to the white school and demand their constitutional right to be admitted. It wasn't in 15, is that right? About 10, 15 years later that court orders began to mandate that schools be integrated. Started in 1968 and, um, into the early 70s, there were a series of court orders. And that's what really changed things, particularly in the South, that you couldn't have a separate black school and a separate white school. And you started to have busing, forcing the schools to integrate. So, and of course, over time, it seems that especially if we look at the the general makeup of schools today in different parts of the country, different cities you go to in different neighborhoods, it seems that de facto segregation is actually returning because you look at the, again, the population makeup of a lot of these schools. So what do we think, what, in your estimation, what can be the cause of this, I guess, resurgence, if you will, of the segregated school? It's really complicated to explain. It's not like schools that once were quite integrated by the, say, 70s and 80s, suddenly kids started separating again. I think what you have are two forces happening simultaneously. One is massive demographic shifts in the U.S. population. The Hispanic population's gone from a tiny slice 
to a really big, um, you know, almost a third of the population. And so what that means is when you walk into any school, they all have a lot more Hispanic students in it. One of the professors I talked to was that even the quote unquote white schools in L.A., they're all 40 percent Hispanic now. Mm. So what that means is when you walk into a school that there are many, many that 80, 90 percent of the kids are black, brown and Asian and very few kids are white. When you look at the percentage of the white population in U.S. public schools, it's less than 50 percent now, whereas in the early 70s, I think it was, you know, 85 percent white. So it, it's a little bit hard to compare things historically when you had a black white mix where the vast majority of students in the country were white. And now you have a black, white, Hispanic, Asian mix where fewer than half of the students are white. And that just makes it a little bit more complicated to understand the figures. In a way, it's not black and white. (laughs) The second force that's happening is we've had the advent of school choice. And what that means is in a particular school district, more and more families have the choice to go beyond their neighborhood catchment and choose whatever school they want to go to. And then you have the rise of charter schools. And so what's happened is a lot of families have kind of marched with their two feet, choosing schools that they think are best for their kids' education. And sometimes black families choose certain schools and sometimes Hispanic families choose certain schools and sometimes white families choose certain schools and they don't all have the same preferences. And that's another big reason that the schools are particularly in the largest cities where school choice is more of a factor. That's one of the reasons we're seeing a bit of into a bit more segregation. But I really want to point out to listeners, like when you look at segregation levels in the late 60s, they were enormous. Mm -hmm. Um, There were so many schools where 90 percent of the school was white and 90 percent of the school was black. I mean, they, they were they were really separate. We don't have segregation levels like that today. Yes, we've had an uptick over the last 20 years, but we are still far, far below from that old reality. And, you know, and I'm glad that you talked a little bit about the school choice, because I think that's probably one of the bigger um, reasons why you have this, I guess, perception that that segregation is on the rise again, because, again, people are going to go to the schools that either that they feel that they're going to get the the, the best opportunity, as you mentioned. But a lot of a lot of families are choosing schools where the majority of the students and look like them. And so they want to be more comfortable. They're going to be in areas because again, yeah, they saw what was happening in the fifties, sixties and seventies. They, they grew up in that era with the, almost like the, the daily fights and things like that in the school. And they don't want that for their children. So at least if they send them to a school where they are, are around people who look like them, then the likelihood of them getting into those daily types of melees is going to be reduced. But I think, but, I would like to also maybe throw in as well. One of the reasons is because we live in such a transient society. Now people don't stay in with very few exceptions. People really don't stay in the same neighborhood all the time. So they are, they have more means to move out or more opportunities or, or things that force them to leave the particular area. And maybe that's also contributing to why the perception at least is that, uh, integration is reducing and segregation is actually on the rise. That's interesting. I I actually think the mobility has helped improve integration because Mm. we have more and more black families and Hispanic families moving to the suburbs. And that's helped um, increase the racial diversity of suburban schools. And then you've had um, many upper income white gentrifiers coming back into cities And on the face of it, that has helped um, increase integration into city schools. However, Mm -hmm. simultaneously, there's been school choice. And what we see sometimes is that the, say, upper income white gentrifiers, they might prefer a bit more of what people call a progressive education. And they, they might 
be attracted to schools that have certain teaching philosophies. And that doesn't always resonate with um, other communities. Mm. Um, maybe some black families would prefer a bit more of a traditional method where kids are taught phonics and are taught their times tables. And so there are just different cultural preferences sometimes. So let's get into a little bit more into the, the weeds of all of this. And uh, what are some of the, I guess, the the data points that we can point to to that will show this gap? And so what are we actually utilizing to show that there is a gap between or among the uh, black students and white students that took place at one point and seems to be narrowing, then is widened? So what where do we get these numbers from? So I am relying right now on two scholars, Sean Reardon at Stanford University and Ann Owens at the University of Southern California. And they chose a particular way of measuring segregation. There are about a half dozen different ways and sometimes they get quite complicated. Mm -hmm. I like this one because it's simple to understand. Imagine that you're a white student and the average white student has what exposure to other white students. So for example, I think it's great to start with an example because then yes. you can understand this sort of segregation index. Back in 19, um, let me get the figure for you exactly. In North Carolina's Charlotte Mecklenburg district back in 1968, um, the average white student attended a school where 90% of his peers were white and only 10% were black. And the average black student attended a school where 76 of his peers were black and only 24% were white. So you, you, what you do is you just look at the gap in exposure to each race. The mm -hmm. white students had 90% white. The black students had 24% white. And the difference is 66 percentage points. Then you look at what happened a few years later after the court ordered integration. And that gap went from 66 percentage points to three percentage points. Oh, it, wow. The schools exactly reflected the racial composition in the city. Mm -hmm. And so then what, what you're doing when you're measuring segregation across the country is you're looking at those exposure gaps and they average them for hundreds of districts around the United States. And you could see that extreme version um, in the late 60s and how it really goes down. And so there's a there's a graph I have that's really hard to explain on radio, but just imagine um, a dramatic water slide and you're sort of at the bottom of the, the roller coaster slide there. And then what you see is it's just kind of level for a while in the, in the late 70s and 80s. And then it just begins to uptick very, very subtly. You almost can't see it. To my eyes, it looks like a flat line, just looks like an even C. Mm -hmm. But when you zoom in on it and you kind of expand the Y axis so you can see tiny, tiny differences, you see that it's starting to uptick again. And when you look at the figures, what, when, you, when you look at it in detail, of the 533 largest U.S. districts with at least 2,500 Black students, you see a 25% increase in segregation. But if you zoom in on the 100 largest districts, these are the big cities in America, then you see a 64% increase in segregation. And so that's why those scholars are saying school choice is having a really big role here. What can we, I guess, what can we point to, or is, it, is there any one particular academic area that we can point to to show where, how this get this gap is has been kind of uh, illustrated. Is it, is, are we looking at numbers from reading scores? Are we looking at math scores? What how are we? What what numbers are we looking at to show that there is a an achievement gap? Right. So that's that's the question. So we have a little bit more segregation now. We have a, a kind of more than a little bit more in the big cities. So what? What's happening to students? Right. That's the big question. So I separately looked at black and white test scores since the early 1970s to see what was happening. And what the big picture is that black um, student scores are much higher today than they were in the 70s. I mean, so are white student scores. Everyone's doing better than, um, what is that, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
And you see that the gap has closed a bit. That is the the difference between white scores and black scores is not quite as big as it used to be. But when you look at things over time, we see all this improvement. You see in math and in reading for nine-year-olds, for 13-year-olds, things seem to be getting really much better in the 70s and 80s as this integration is happening. We can't per se for sure that integration is the cause of it because we also had other things going on. We had President Johnson's war on poverty. We had a lot more money and resources going into low-income schools. And so we can't say for sure that integration is what created these benefits. It could be some other things that were happening. And then what we start to notice, especially in the 2000s and the 2010s, depending on the subject and depending on the age, Black achievement really starts to turn the other direction. In some cases, it almost seems to nosedive. When I looked at one particular, I think it was um, math, yes, Average math scores for 13-year-olds, 40 years of progress for Black students just seem to disappear between 2010 and the present day. So something really wrong is going on. But I I also can't say that I would totally attribute it to the slight uptick in segregation. Mm -hmm. We have a lot more poverty in our country. We have um, all these reforms that have happened. We've had the introduction of Common Core, which um, teachers didn't have a lot of training for it. We had the introduction of mass testing and a lot of teaching to the test. And so there are so many things going on simultaneously, but it, it, it's really disturbing to see Black achievement um, uh, reversing and to see the achievement gaps between white and Black students getting wider again. But again, just like with the segregation data, it's so important for um, listeners out there to realize that we are still much better than we were in the in the early 70s. There has been some progress. It's just that, you know, three, three steps forward, two steps back sometimes. You are listening to Instruction Discussion on the Voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Kevin Boston Hill, and our guest today is Jill Barche, journalist with the Heckinger Report. Now, let me let me ask you this, and because it, it seems that with the those test scores and with all the, the we saw that w- when you pump a lot of money and resources into school systems, there's improvement. Then, of course, what ha- what does government do in their all infinite wisdom? They see the improvement and say, OK, problem solved. And they remove all those resources and funding again. And then what happens? Test scores go back down. So it seems to me <laughs> Maybe I'm looking at this extremely uh, simplistic, but it seems to me if you keep the resources in the school system, in the neighborhoods that need that use them, then achievement levels would continue to to rise or at least they would they wouldn't falter. So how do we make sure that whatever resources and funding that was initially put into a school remain there even after they see the the increase in achievement? Oh, that's a policy question (laughs) for lawmakers, right? Um, I mean, we're going through an amazing experiment with um, money for schools right now. The federal government has been pumping $109 billion more dollars into U.S. schools around the country. And low-income schools have been getting a much larger share of it than um, wealthier schools. That money is um, going to start to expire in September. Some of it they'll be able to keep using for a little while longer if there's some longer term contracts. For example, schools have been using it to hire more teachers. Um, According to one study I read, um, about 20% of that money has gone to hire new teachers and you can't use that money to pay teachers salaries after September 2024 this Mm. fall. So we're expecting huge teacher layoffs. Oh, yeah. I mean, we'll see what's going to happen. First of all, do we know that this money has even improved student achievement? That's a first question. I I think it's going to be really hard to prove that because student absenteeism has been so high. Mm. And even though we've pumped a lot of money into schools and offered kids tutoring to catch up, kids aren't showing up to these tutoring sessions. The kids who really, especially the kids who need it. So I think it's an open question about how much academic boost we're going to get for this money. 
And then when the money, um, when the plug is pulled on this money, what will happen afterwards? Um, I'll be covering it. <laughs> and, I, and I look forward to reading about your, your coverage of it as well. Um, I, I'm wondering, I know you said that from the 2000s up until t- even today, the achievement of black students seems to have continuously gone down. Now, I wonder how much of an impact has the last few years, especially since the pandemic? What have those have there been spikes in drops during that time or has it really just kind of leveled off, uh, gone down kind of equally even during those the pandemic years? Oh, it's been a spike downward. And yeah. let's just take some of these examples. Let's take math scores yep. for nine year olds. That's what that had been like a real upward march and success story. That was one where black achievement hasn't really been deteriorating until the pandemic. And then you see this sharp downward nosedive, yep. it looks like. But then let's take the another one. Um, math scores are different. I just I think I just talked about Oh, you know what, Kevin? I just screwed up. I want to clarify something I just That's said. Okay. So it was it was reading yeah. that was um, for nine-year-olds that was showing a nice upward march. And it wasn't until the pandemic that you really saw a nosedive. Mm. Then with now I'm looking at math. Well, that was also a nice upper trajectory. So so for the younger kids, the nine-year-olds, it's really just been since the pandemic that you're seeing the nosedive in yep. math and reading. It's 13-year-olds. Um, so these are, how old are they? They're, they're, um, We're talking, they're 13, they're thir- but, but I'm what? thinking they're in middle school. They are. They're, yeah, 13 they're is middle grade. school. Exactly. 13 is middle school. Yes. And this is where you see the deterioration happening before the pandemic. Mm. And I I see it for reading really after 2012 and in math, I see it. Yeah. Around the same time. So around 2012 is where you're seeing the nosedives right. for 13 year olds. And what is happening for middle schoolers? I, w- I was writing articles about it and people <clears throat> were kind of throwing spaghetti up at the wall because like, why, why are these kids deteriorating? What is happening? Well, you know, and having uh, worked in middle schools for a, a lot of my career, I can probably I can give a or at least a theory that I have behind that, because what I've seen was in at least in the elementary school, students are in pretty much one classroom all day. And and so they have more more that 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 constant touch with their teachers and the teachers take more of a uh, almost like a, a parental type of of relationship with the students because they're with them with the teaching. Once you get to middle school, students see multiple teachers throughout the day. So they don't really have time to build that solid relationship with a teacher being with them for 45, maybe 90 minutes in a particular day. Even parents decide that, okay, now you're going to have more freedom. So I'm not going to hover over you to do your homework or to to help you understand certain things. And and to be honest, a lot of parents are math phobic at this point because they don't think that they can understand the math that their students are learning. So they kind of shy away a little bit more. They're not as hands on as they were in elementary school. So I think there's that dynamic that's at play as well, that the level of attention that is being given to our students from the adults in their lives isn't as great as it was when they were in elementary school. You see a lot of students who were on the honor roll and high honor roll in elementary school are now barely passing when they get to middle school. And and so we have to like the question is, well, why is this happening? And I think one of those reasons is just the level of attention that they receive from the parent, from the adults in their lives. Kevin, I would love that theory. If if there had been a policy change in 2012, where suddenly middle school kids start changing classes and having lots of teachers, but before 2012, they all had the same teacher, because that would explain a nice upward rise for 13 year olds. And then suddenly in 2012, it's reversing and going the other direction. Mm. But we've had kids changing classes and not having those form those strong adult bonds for decades. So it doesn't explain the change Mm. in 2012. 
one of the leading theories is something else. What started happening in the 2010s? What do you what changed about middle school kids? Oh wow. Uh you're gonna have to help me out on this one. Um, let me see if I can show you something that might trigger your brain. I we we are, we're seeing oh, each other on Zoom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, and you, that may actually that makes sense because of I always say that students today are digital natives, whereas we are the digital immigrants. We're trying, we're just learning it, and they were born into it. So yes, they they that's when they all the everything became digitized. Right. So tell tell your listeners what I showed on our Zoom screen. <laughs> was it a CD? I think it was, or a. Well, it was just a Kindle because I was Kindle, looking right. for my cell phone, but I didn't see it. But so kids are having cell phones, right. and they're using iPads. And so one of the leading theories is that kids are getting very interested in texting each other, and they're using social media. They're not reading as much. They're not doing their homework as much. Maybe they're struggling to pay attention in mm. school as much as they used to. And we can't prove it yet, but it's one of the leading theories. And it would be interesting to see how that actually all that pans out. So what do we think are some of the the overall ramifications now that if we are not able to start to close this achievement gap, what are some of the future ramifications of our overall society if we if we can't close the gap? Well, these kids are going to graduate from high school, and a lot of them will be graduating with high grades. That's one of the things we've noticed, is that even though we're seeing this deterioration in objective sort of gold standard test scores, the the school systems are very interested in passing these children on from grade to grade and graduating them from high school. The question is, what happens when they get to college? Mm. And colleges are seeing a lot of kids who are not able to do the work, who don't have the basic math skills to major in a science or technology field. And for for kids who don't have this, these basic foundational skills, there's a lot of fear that they won't be able to get degrees, they won't be able to get good jobs. And ultimately, it's going to affect the whole U.S. economy. Some of them will, more of them will have to be reliant on social safety nets. And they won't be as productive members of society, adding to our GDP and our and boom, helping our um, stock market go up. So ultimately, everybody's going to suffer. Wow, that's, that doesn't paint a very rosy picture for our future. But we would certainly like to thank our guest today, Jill Barshay, journalist with the Heckinger Report, for coming on to our show. Thank you, Kevin. It was a pleasure to be here. And once again, my name is Kevin Boston Hill. And thank you all for listening to Instruction Discussion right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.